Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. And this week on episode 174, I'm speaking with Jake Wright of Bearded Gear on YouTube. Uh, if you're a knife guy on YouTube and you've been uh, relying on the uh, the good word of excellent reviewers to uh, let you know what the latest and greatest knives are, you know who Jake is. Uh, he's been out. Uh, he's been he's had a channel for a while, but he's been active for about a year, and he's been doing a video a day and really knocking out uh, the the gear and mostly uh, knives review. At least that's what I see, but we all see life through our own lens. So I'm happy to have Jake on the show tonight and. Um, He's come on Thursday Night Knives a couple of times. We've had a chance to uh, uh, to just uh, get things started, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to continue the conversation here. So uh, Jake from Bearded Gear will be here in just a moment. And before we go there, I just want to uh, remind everybody uh, that we have a Patreon page uh, with a three, five, or $10 uh, support level. So if you think what we do here on this uh, show is valuable, please go there. And uh, if you have the extra scratch in these hard times, and uh, you feel like sending it our way, we would greatly appreciate it, and we'll put it to good use. So now, without further delay, I bring you Jake from Bearded Gear. Have a knife you want featured or reviewed? Call the Knife Junkies 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and let us know. Jake, how you doing? Welcome to the podcast. I am doing well. How are you, Bob? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Well, uh, some th- uh, way I like to start uh, all... Uh, reviewer interviews is with a pocket check because uh, you guys all have your fingers on the pulse of what's going on. And uh, I have noticed recently, you know, I've been, I, I'm subscribed to you. I've been watching your channel for probably about a half a year now. I know you've been around for a little over a year. Uh, doing less than that, actually. I oh, started in March. So, <laughs> oh, in March. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So you've been around for nine months now and yep. you're, you're doing gangbusters. Uh, you and I have concurrent tastes, I got to say, parallel tastes. So I'm very interested. What do you have in your pocket today? Um, I'm carrying two knives. I usually am. Actually, no, I set my primary down on the table next to me. So I've been carrying today the Chavez oh. 229. This is the React manufactured version, not a full custom or anything, but it's the blackout version and the drop point. Uh, I think this was a an exclusive from, I think his name is Tom Wynn. I don't know how you say it, um, but he's a retailer who sells Chavez knives. I got it secondary, so I didn't buy it from him, but I, uh, I really like that Chavez. And then just today, I opened up this little guy. This is the brand new Giant Mouse Ace Riv, which they actually just dropped today. And I was lucky uh, Jim over at Giant Mouse was willing to send me one just a hair early so that I could start reviewing it. And so my unboxing just went live today, but this has been in my pocket ever since I opened it up. Beautiful. Now I know you have a thing for my Carta and I also know you have a, you have a small collection of uh, giant mouse knives. Can you hold that one back up, please? Absolutely. That's just a honey. I mean, you look at that and, and it's in that same design language. And uh, to me, that's, um, you know what? That's the Pilar that I would carry. You know, uh, many people have asked if it was Vox kind of putting out the proper Pilar that people have been wanting all along. I heard him say the other day in an interview that it's not. It's a different knife. If he wanted to make a perfect Pilar, he would. He already makes the customs, which are in nice materials. But right, right. Um, I think it's it's reminiscent of it's it's a lot like a Pilar, kind of like a Suru as well, kind of in that same size. But I, I'm digging it so far on first impressions. So that's a three inch blade, I'm assuming, or right around two there. and a half. It's a little guy. Two and so a half. So it's inch. like the size of a spider code dragonfly. Oh wow. Okay, I see. Real small. It looks bigger in the hand, but ah, uh, oh, it's a the beautiful. forward choil helps. You get a nice full four finger grip on it, but little blade, small cutting edge, and it's a it's a secondary for a reason. <laughs> it's, it yeah. goes in my back pocket or my coin pocket. Looks broad, thin, and slicey. Now the Chavez. Uh, let me ask you a quick question about that. So, mm-hmm. uh, my my issue with Chavez has always been, as it is with many, the clip. Um, sure. I I'm just not a skull guy. I was at one time, uh, you know, and 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 this is, you know, I I get it. I really do. I I get the aesthetic and different um um different cultures have different associations with it and all that. Uh, but for me, it's just it's just not the thing. I I go for discrete clips and. 
And it's almost like a blessing that that clip is on that knife because I feel like if it weren't, I would have every Chavez out there because they're, man, they are fine. What do you think of that knife? Yeah, so I'm in the same boat on the clip. I've never been a fan of skull anything. I don't own clothing with skulls on it. I'm not like, it's not my thing, right? There's dudes who wear like big skull steel flame rings. Yeah, yeah. That's not me. Um, but I really like Ramon. And even though the clip has always turned me off of the knife to a degree, I almost at this point just think of it as like his signature on the mm -hmm. knife. Mm -hmm. And it when I look at it, in my pocket and all I see is the clip. I don't love that it's skull shaped. My favorite pocket clips are deep carry clips that go all the way to the butt end of the knife, hide the knife and don't have any words on them. Or I want it to just yeah. look like it could be a clip to anything. I live yes. in LA and it's not generally the best thing for me to have a clip that looks like even without a knife, the clip wants to kill you. So um, <laughs> because I see it as Ramon's signature, I kind of give it a pass and I like the knife so much, but yeah, yeah, I would, I don't know. I, I think there are people who make custom clips for those. It just would feel wrong for me to swap the clip because it is so much of his identity in the night. Yeah. Yes, I, I would agree. It's almost like I wouldn't want it without it, but something about it keeps me from getting it. But I don't think that's going to last for long because the overall profile of that knife uh, and, and pretty much all, of, not every single one, there's a worn clip that to me looks a little awkward, but mm. pretty much everything else, his tantos and his drop points. If you just hold them up to the sky, or if you look at them in silhouette, they are, they, they have that perfection thing going on. Yeah. That, that magical ratio. So I, I, I kind of foresee, especially with the Riot construction, I kind of for, for see one in my future, even if it's temporary, but uh, yeah, I'm with uh, you. I think the design is, is, phenomenal it's like really restrained so simple but it's got just the right amount of like little details sprinkled all over it yeah it's, it's special while being simple which is kind of hard to accomplish and it's muscular you know it's got a, it's got a bit of the menace which i i tend to tend to gravitate to. okay so we've talked about your pocket check how did you get into this obviously you have a, a passion for knives and a really refined taste at this point for what you like and what you think is valuable how'd you get into this uh into this game and how did you start uh making uh, videos Sure. So do you want like long-term, how did I get into knives or yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Like grandfather's knives or whatever, whatever the story is. Yeah. Sure. So, um, I grew up not far from here, just outside of LA County. Um, and I'm the youngest of five kids. I've got two brothers and my dad and both my brothers are each really into not just knives, but firearms and like hiking and outdoor gear. And especially my dad really instilled that in us as children. And so even to this day, each of my brothers are both also into knives. You'll always find them with a knife in their pocket, but they're not like I am in it. I'm definitely the one who's really kind of gone deepest down the rabbit hole, if you will. But I've just always had an affinity. It kind of started with like, being a kid watching action movies, you want to have the gear, right? And so I wanted what was coolest and flashiest and big fixed blades were fun. And um, growing up, we had a backyard that wasn't developed. We had a, a large backyard and the entire time we lived in that house, there were like these grand plans for like this pool we were going to put in and stuff. It just never happened. All right. So we had this, I don't know, maybe half acre yard. It's not like giant, but it was big enough. And it was just like natural growth of like Southern California, like, weeds up to your hip and some trees that had grown on their own. And so we'd go to the cold steel parking lot sale every year. They were like 45 oh, yeah. minutes from where I grew up, their headquarters. And so I had spears and swords and just all the like nerdy white kids stuff to have. And I was allowed to just go in the backyard because it was undeveloped. Yeah. And so I'd like, we had old like trash bins and boogie boards and I'd practice throwing spears at them and like crossbow. And I was just like that nerdy kid who was into it, right? And then as, as time went on and I kind of grew out of like wanting to swing swords around and not be into martial arts, like just like be the weirdo who <laughs> left <laughs> yeah. what they were. Um, I, I just, I restrained myself to like refining my taste in pocket knives. And so I think it was in probably like 2008 or nine. My dad gave me a really nice bench made. It's the Sentinel. I actually think I have it. Um, Sentinel. Yeah, it's an old Alishawitz design. Oh, yeah. And so this is a knife that my dad carried for a while. You'll see it's partially serrated. It's got really aggressive jimping in a bunch of places. Um, but it's a titanium liner lock with aluminum uh, kind of 
bolsters or scales over it. You can see it's kind of split, but you can see the titanium through it. Just a really nice knife, especially for the yeah. time. And so as I started like appreciating better and better knives and not just carrying like $10 knives, I'd get at a gun show or um, I had like Smith and Wesson knives and CRKTs and a lot of that kind of stuff. But ultimately it got to a point where it was like, I was appreciating the differences between not so nice gear and really nice gear and understanding why <laughs> prices yeah. were starting to be justified. And um, so then I still like, being a, a younger gentleman, I'm only 28 now. So oh, um, it, when I was like a late teenager, I didn't have the money to buy really nice knives. So there were a couple that were kind of handed down to me from my dad, more fixed blades than, um, than folders at that point. But, and then like I started dating my wife and she got me a really nice ZT, the 0350, which back in 2011, that would have been, was like a really cool knife. That was when ZT was kind of coming onto the scene still. And um, I still own that knife. It's a gift from her. Now that's when the that's that. when the ring came yeah. out. That's when you started worrying about that ring, right? <laughs> yeah, um, she's a keeper, I think, man. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, I as I just started getting a few nicer pieces, it became more and more important to me. And then for years, I just kind of carried the same few nicer knives. But probably four or five years ago now, I just got deeper into like watching YouTube videos and following knife pages on Instagram. And then that's a real dangerous thing to do if you don't want to spend money because then you see like it was a whole world of how much there actually was besides Benchmade and ZT and Spyderco. Those were like what I was aware of and Cold Steel, of course, but now there's so much more than that. And so I just started collecting and for a couple of years on Instagram, I got into sharing pictures of the knives. Uh, when I started, my page was called Knives, Guns, Cars. I did automotive photography at <laughs> nice. the time. So I'd share, I, I was a slave to my feed. I had like light box white photos in two columns and then a, a car photo in the middle. Mm. And so if you looked at my page, it was all like a perfect line of white <laughs> knife photos and then right. cars in the middle. Um, and I got sick of having to post in threes and like only post light box photos and knives. So ultimately that changed. And um, and then I started the channel once COVID hit, cause I finally had time to do it. And I'd been thinking about it for a long time and sure. wanted to, I had all the knives around already. Like I, I had the stuff to make content of and I'm not short for words. So <laughs> I just kind of jumped in and, um, yeah, just started building a library of content and going for it. It seems like having a channel and posting daily, which you do, right? Pretty much daily. Yeah, I post more, at more least than one that. video a day. Um, lately, it's more often that I do two. When I started, it was three or four a day to build wow. a, a library. Yes. So I think I'm just over 400 videos, and it's been nine months. That's <laughs> uh, amazing. And uh, but but also in a way, there's um, well, first of all, it seems like there's something a little obsessive with how you had the. Uh, and I'm not saying this in a bad way, but, but I mean, artistically so obsessive in how you had your feed on Instagram. You mm -hmm. stop doing that. You switch over to making uh, videos and you have this very regular regimented uh, output. And that's something that Jim has always talked to me about. Uh, you know, you got to be regular. You got to be regular. You got to keep bringing stuff out. And uh, and and you're a machine, man. And uh, uh and I think that that's great because you have given people an, an impression of who you are, a pretty good idea of who you are in a very short period of time. So people trust you. You've gained a lot of followers. And, uh, well, there's something magical that happens. It's like a golden mean. You bring uh, a visual social media together with uh, knives, which are kind of just visual in general because that's how you – and then men – who are visual creatures. And, and I think that, uh, you know, well, I mean, my, my wife would bristle at that statement because she loves knives and, and, uh, that's one of the ways we actually met, but, uh, uh, but there's, there's something there with the, with the visual nature of it and, uh, and just exposing a broader audience to, to, to knives. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's what I want to look at and it's what I want to talk about. And so for me, I think it's important that I stay in a, a groove. I do best when I've like kind of got the momentum mm -hmm. and now it's really easy for me to put up one or two videos a day. Like it's, it's just what I'm used to doing. And I'm lucky that it, when COVID hit, that was the first time that I wasn't working full time. <laughs> and then for like six months, I didn't work at all. I ended up going back to work for a little bit 
And that was the hardest time to keep putting up the volume of content that I was used to doing. Um, but then that kind of stopped again. And now it's unclear whether I'll even be going back because I've gotten to a point where with what my wife does, she works from home. She's a creative um, and she's actually like a, a mommy blogger. Um, so I shoot most of her content. So having me to be more available, we've found that we actually don't really lose money. <laughs> me not going to work because we're able to pick up more work for her as she's growing. And then now my channel's monetized. So it's not, it's hardly anything yet, but the idea long-term is that I'm just going to kind of keep on this creative spell. And with the amount of like scheduling of what she does, it's pretty easy to fit in. I pretty much have like a block of time in the morning and then evenings are mine because I'm not shooting any pictures for her after it's dark. And so that's when I crank out content and uh, just kind of make it happen. That is a really interesting story dynamic slash circumstance, you know, um, especially, you know, right now everyone's circumstances changed and, and things have evolved and, you know, or whatever changed. And there's yeah. a, you know, like my wife works from home every day, all the time too. Um, she's, you know, we're, we're in a totally different industry, but it's very interesting to me that you and she can, can, uh, are, are both doing this kind of, um, I don't know, living in this sort of virtual, uh, occupational world. And, you know, you're both kind of, it, you know, it sounds like your wife is doing really well. It sounds that I know that you're taken off and uh, that's a, that's an interesting modern contemporary story, you know, that you've never heard before because it's never happened before. Yeah. It's I, and for me, it was when I decided to do the channel, I didn't want to just start a YouTube channel and kind of like haphazardly go about it. Cause I'd been thinking about it for so long mm -hmm. and it just, it, if I was going to do it, I had to really do it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I, I didn't want to go in half heartedly. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just like hit the ground running and try to do as much as I could, as quick as I could. And I, I haven't let up off the gas yet. It, I'm still putting out a ton of content and I'm hopefully improving and, and getting better as well. But the goal from the very beginning was ultimately if I can get to a point where that can be what I do in some way, shape or form, whether I mold it into eventually designing knives through all that I learn and the people that I meet and all that. Yeah. I'm super interested in doing that. I'm, I'm kind of starting to dip my toes into that a little bit. Um, but even if it's just content creation in this arena, I love doing that. You know, there's so many things in this sphere that I would love to do. And the knife world is small, but there's room in it. And so the plan for me was really just to, to kind of start, actually getting into it. I'd been ob observing the knife world for a yes. long time. I know who the players are and what they do. And my I'm nerdy enough that I care about the intricacies of what goes into uh, these knife companies and their designs and how they come to market and the way that they put a knife together and what goal they're trying to accomplish with the knife. And so it was important to me to kind of find my way into this segment as more than just an observer. And I, I think so far, I'm really happy that I've kind of become part of the community to an extent. I'm still fairly small, all things considered, but it's been a great start. So I'm, I'm really liking it. Well, so uh, some of the videos I like the best that you put out, you shoot in these gorgeous locations out where you live. Uh, I'm on the East Coast and, uh, you know, I, there's plenty of beauty around here too, but I look at your kind of beauty out there. It's exotic to me, the canyon that you hang out in and yeah. such. Um, uh, what... <laughs> What, what, how do you use knives? And then, and then we got it. We got to talk about the flip story, <laughs> but, but tell um, me how you use knives in your everyday life, you know, and this, this, uh, this started when you were a kid, you said, so what do you do? Sure. So I kind of have like, in my mind's eye, there's two categories of knife for me, at least for folders. And the main one is EDC knives. Cause I'm not up in the mountains every day. And for every person, I think their definition of what they require out of EDC gear is different. But for me, most of my everyday carry knives, the things I do most of them are open up boxes and process the cardboard for the dumpster. I open a lot of like Barbie type toys for my daughter. Yeah. Um, Release they, them from those zip ties and such. Yeah, the realm that my wife works in, she gets sent a lot of product and it revolves around my daughter. And so there's uh, constant packages coming in with children's toys. And uh, people who don't have kids won't understand, but those who do know that getting into <laughs> the kids packaging without cutting the toy and like releasing it from 
it's like a sport in its own. Um, <laughs> so I do a lot of that kind of stuff, zip ties, cardboard, all the fairly typical I'd consider type of stuff, but I'm not a tradesman. I'm not an electrician or working on a construction site. So for me, hard use really on an EDC knife is mostly like processing the cardboard for the dumpster. Every now and then there'll be a project around the house that I'm working on, like putting a wallpaper on a wall or something and I'll be cutting more stuff, but it's, it's kind of rare. So then the other category for me is I am an avid hiker. I spend at least two days a week. I try to be regularly up there. Uh, sometimes it's a lot more, um, but I live right at the foothills of the San Gabriel mountains here. I'm in the Pasadena area. And so we have serious mountains right here. A lot of people, when they think of Los Angeles, they don't think of these mountains that are literally part of LA County. And it's not like Griffith Park where you see like the Hollywood sign, like those are hills compared to the, the mountains that I hike in. And there's a lot of canyons and, and passages here that are really kind of unkept. And I have to go off trail and just explore to see what I can find. Like that canyon you referred to, that I kind of sit up on the top of is a spot that's really only known to the local rock climbers who use it as a repelling point. And so like, I just had to figure out my way up there. And I love hikes like that where I'm kind of pushing myself, but inherently when I'm off trail and in like thick, deep stuff, I, I use fixed blades a lot. And I, if I have a folder on me, which I always have a folder on me, then I make sure that I'm carrying things that are capable of going way beyond what my ADC knives are. So like my favorite outdoor knife currently would be like my 8020, which is 3V oh, yeah. blade steel, the shark lock, it's a thick blade stock and uh, it's just robust. And uh, I mean, I have batoned with it. I've cleared a, a bunch of overhanging stuff over trails and just all kinds of like nasty work to do with a folder. And so I, I love finding like what I consider almost like adventure knives that are like knives I trust for stuff like that, for like, I don't know where I'm going today. So yeah. whatever yeah. I have has to be capable of whatever the worst it could be is, you know? And I, yeah. So there's like EDC around the city, everyday carry comfortable on my couch kind of knives. And then there's knives like that. Right. Right. Okay. So how much do you get into fixed blades being an outdoorsman? Um, uh, I, I am not an outdoorsman. I'd like to be aspiring outdoorsman, uh, sure. but uh, I do have the knives for it. <laughs> <laughs> Come on out. Let's yeah. <laughs> so, oh, cool. Hey, man. Uh, accepted. When when I can, I will. I love it out there. And I've been in the San Gabriel Mountains, and they are real mountains, especially to an East Coaster. You know, who's, yeah. All our mountains are old and worn down. But so you have a. a I, I mentioned before that you and I have parallel tastes and it's, it, uh, you know, I make no secret of the fact that my, my love for tactical knives is, is also like you. Uh, well, it was born out of predator and commando and Rambo and, yeah. um, and, and so still, and, and then also Daniel Boone and the stuff, you know, I'm about 20 years, your senior and the stuff I was watching on TV uh, in the, in the early, you know, in the seventies when I was a young, young kid, everyone had a Bowie knife. You know, yeah. there's Daniel Boone and there was Davy Crockett and there was Grizzly Adams. There were all these shows, you know. Absolutely. On, on yeah, I, mean, I just watched the most recent Rambo. Again, it's a shame that I've seen that a couple of times because it's an awful movie, but. Um, Awfully good. It's, it's a lot of fun to watch. I'll say that. <laughs> the acting and the story. Anyways, um, he has that new Rambo knife. Like his, it's kind yeah. of Bowie-esque. Like and uh, I see that. And I immediately, I'm like, I need to have that knife. I don't at all. I don't plan on buying it. But as right. I see it on the screen and it looks so cool in the movie, yeah. it's like, I have to get one of those. You know, that still happens mm -hmm. in my brain. I think most men probably do kind of have that. Right, right. It steel has a way of drawing men to it. Yeah. That's, a, that's, that's a Virgil quote because I'm so educated. Now, <laughs> I, it's, it's, it, it, I just happen to know that. Uh, however, what I was getting at is this. Tactical. You you don't seem like a tactical guy. I know I'm not a tactical guy, but I have a real love for those kind of knives. It also seems like you have kind of a you're kind of drawn to that kind of thing. Where where does that taste come from? Uh, because it's distinctly not an outdoorsy kind of knife, and it's not really an EDC knife. Sure. Um, so I guess I would start by saying I've actually been having some really interesting conversations 
um, about tactical knives lately with a couple of friends who just are kind of like minds in the space that do a lot of like written reviews, a couple other reviewers, and we have interesting conversations. I think the word tactical gets used incorrectly a lot in the EDC world mm -hmm. and in like the knife realm, because to me, a tactical knife, what my mind says when I hear tactical is this knife is designed to cut flesh and that's it. It's to kill other human beings. Like this is military. It's a fighting knife, right? But a fighting knife is different than tactical knife in a lot of ways. Cause to some people, tactical means search and rescue. Um, it can mean yeah. a variety of different tasks and like, even within the military, a lot of the guys in the military who carry tactical knives, mm -hmm. they're not even planning to use them in combat. It's more so a, a tool that they can trust to get them into buildings and through places. And I gotcha. um, so for me, it's like, I'm kind of coming to terms with what I think tactical is because the things I don't like about tactical knives are I don't love aggressive jimping. It drives mm -hmm. me crazy when ergos are already good and then you throw like serrations for my finger onto a knife i like, don't like that. like the new sog xr um seal which is I, yeah i haven't every... handled it but i looking at it i can tell you i don't want to hold it um <laughs> i reviewed a benchmade contigo a ways back oh, and yeah. it felt yeah, like the is... handle was sharper than the blade it's, it's like, just like it's like holding a saw yeah i don't like that um i also i don't like when knives are like unpurposefully thick like I said, that 8020 is a really thick knife, but a lot of like tactically marketed knives, I find they like put too thick of materials on just so like it's like, give me, give me an example. Um, Ooh, that's a good question. I try not to buy many if I'm being honest. Mm. I think SOG is one of those probably kind of good examples where like their knives aren't built very robust but they're still kind of thick if that makes sense like the materials being used and the construction of them doesn't inspire confidence in me but they're still like thicker than they need to be yes uh, uh let me let me interrupt you for a second and say that i've i've though hinderer is just about my it's probably my it's in my top three of favorite knives of all time love them dearly uh but i feel like their construction is so robust they can afford to go with some thinner steels um you know, but but maybe that's not what people go to them for. Who knows? Sure. Uh, you know, because there are people who buy hinderers, I would imagine, uh, who use them a lot harder than I do, you know. Absolutely. So, uh, but I'm sorry. Uh, please continue. Yeah, no, I think that's a great example. And like when I analyze what I actually appreciate in a knife that I enjoy carrying, enjoy holding, enjoy cutting with, the things I really do with knives, right? It's usually like the slimmer, the better in profile. Um, the less jimping, the better. I want it to be smooth. I don't need things to be crazy, aggressively textured. And um, I just find that a lot of the like the knives that are most marketed as being tactical are rarely more effective cutting tools for that kind of styling and marketing that they get. And I, so I, I battle with that. It's a, it's a wrestling match that I'm currently in. <laughs> I would bet you that most tactical guys, like actual tactical people, <laughs> whatever that means, would agree with you. Uh, I've, heard, I've heard that operators mostly carry Leatherman <laughs> because they're handy as all hell. Uh, but but OK, so uh, let me let me just just so we can tie this this part of the conversation up in a bow. Let me let, because you're bringing this up and it, it's true. Tactical is a is a sloppy and imprecise term. It's kind of like saying traditional knife. It's like. Right. Oh, okay, well, which well, one are you talking about? And those waters get muddy a lot because you get a lot of knives that are kind of branded for multiple things of these. Like if mm -hmm. I see in the description of a knife, like this knife is as at home on the battlefield as it is in the office. I hate it. <laughs> I don't want that knife. It's nonsense, right? Like don't try to what, give me both what, things. What office do you work in? Man? Right? But like there's too many people who are, are trying to make like, this is the perfect EDC knife, but it's also, and it's like, stop adding things to it. Like be mission specific is, is kind of, I guess what I'm trying to say. All right. So for me then, okay. When I say tactical and I was talking about your tastes and their, to me, it's like, uh, um, not necessarily a fighting knife, but a knife that, uh, that is built in such a way that that is, also a, a a oh geez now now you got me thinking about, I, I gotta write this down. i think i need to write yeah. on it See, every every single primary knife that i carry my primary knife goes 
front right pocket always yep. where my right hand goes if I need a knife in a pinch. And a lot of that is like m- my dad is a CCW gun carrying, like my entire life has had a gun on him everywhere he goes. Living in LA County, that's not as much of an option for me if you're familiar with how that yep. works here. Um, but I've been, I've had ingrained in me an awareness of my surroundings and um, a desire to keep myself and the people around me safe at all times. So in the back of my mind on any knife I ever purchase, I think to myself, is this something I'd be willing to reach for or would I wish I had something else on me? Hmm. And if I would wish I had a different knife on me, it probably shouldn't be what I'm carrying as a primary. So if you look at like the Spyderco Paramilitary 2, one of my favorite knives, it's nothing all that crazy. A ton of people have these. A lot of people love them. Some people hate them. I happen to love the knife. If I needed to defend my life with a knife, I have no reservations about this being the knife that comes out of my pocket that I use to defend myself. But it's not crazy thick. It's not a tanto. It's not like a lot of those things that marketing people tell you is tactical. But if I needed to use this for self-defense, I think it makes a great argument of being a good self-defense knife because ergonomically I can hold on to it. It's got enough grip. It's not going to slip out of my hands. It carries well. It's comfortable. I'm used to using it and cutting with it, whether that's inanimate objects or animate. Like I feel comfortable with the knife. And so this is not marketed as tactical, but... I think it's more tactical than a lot of things that are, you know? Well, in a way, uh, okay. So we're forgetting, we're, I have forced us down this rabbit hole. So I will, I I will say that that, deeper too, that, (laughs) well, fine, that anything that, uh, you are used to and that you would flex into that is tactical. Okay. Uh, what I'm getting at is this $15 rough rider slip joint. Uh, it's, it's sort of based on the GEC Viper, same size and everything. Mm -hmm. Um, carried, in you know tip down reverse grip uh this way it would be a fine tactical knife if you needed to stab someone repeatedly with it you could do it like this because it's it's a stout enough spring you're going against the you're going against the the tension yep. and everything so the, my point is it's a uh, colonel fairbairn i think uh i think it was colonel fairbairn you know the fairbairn sykes designer he was a british trained British commandos in World War II and just a just a certified badass all around the world. Um, he had he was working on the Mexican border in the 30s or 20s or something like this. And he was taken and he was handcuffed or, or tied behind his back and he was being led out into the desert. He had a little pen knife, a little tiny pen knife. He was able to get it out, cut himself free, and he killed his uh, his captor with it. So, I mean, we're talking about a, an inch and a half or two inch blade. So it's more about the the understanding of how to use it, the motivation necessary <laughs> to use it. I think Ed Calderon um, has talked about, like he's designed the Elvia now with Emerson, right? Which is awesome. Yep. I think they look really cool. Yep. Secondary prices are maddening on them. But um, I, I think it's him who I've heard say before that like any knife is a weapon, every single one. And if you look at like, the knives used in like crime, which is a pretty good indicator. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it, it's some knives that are not nearly as cool or as tactical as yeah. a lot of people who are. Dollar in the store kitchen knives. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if it's got an edge on it and if you can grip it, then it's a weapon, you know, and if I've got one that I really like on me, <laughs> then that's a better weapon than one that I'm uncomfortable with or feel I'm like going to slip off of or, you know. Right. Okay, so you you produce tons and tons of content, and on a regular basis, uh, not all of these are your knives. I'm assuming uh, we were we were talking before about how how um, you know well you get a lot of loaners, and mm-hmm. it's a great opportunity to get your hands on things, experience them without having to lay out the cash and commit. Um, Saves me a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> so, but what do you what do you keep in your um, collection? What's your collecting philosophy? What's worth your money? Sure. So. Uh, my collection right now is probably like knives that I personally own that aren't loaners in my possession, knives that I've paid for and, and own. I'm probably creeping up on 40-ish knives, um, and that's a little heavy for me. My collection stays pretty fluid. There are a few knives in it, whether they were gifts or they're just like absolute favorites that are like, they're out of the question, they're staying forever. But I try not to get overly attached to knives, especially now that I've got the channel because it's part of the fun is the chase and it's finding new things that you like. And so I sell 
or trade a lot of knives that I love that have gotten like great reviews from me. They're knives I'd recommend to anybody. But the reality is I hardly get to carry my own knives a lot mm. of the time these days because I have so many loaners or just because I've got so many new things coming in that I have purchased myself. I, my PM2s are some of my favorite knives. I've got two that I love, hardly carry them. My Koenig Arius, mm. favorite knife in my collection at the moment. And a couple times a month it'll get carried. And it's not because I'm afraid to use it. When I carry it, I'll use it like any other knife. Like uh, that was a decision I made when I bought it. It's not off bounds for being in, in my in my pocket and getting used. But I just, I constantly have multiple knives I'm in the process of reviewing. And for me to feel comfortable doing a full review on a knife, I make myself carry it. Uh, even if I don't like it, even if I'm not crazy yeah. about the knife, yeah. I'll have to have carried it a minimum five or six times over the course of at least a week. And I have to have used it a certain amount. If I ever use a knife less than that, like if it's a loaner, that's really pretty that the owner isn't comfortable with me using, then I am very direct in my review that this is not based on cutting mm -hmm. and carry. This is just, I fidgeted with it at my desk. Otherwise you can assume I've carried it. I've cut with it and I've really felt it out. So that just excludes a lot of my own knives from having pocket time, which is a great problem to have. Like it's a total first world problem that a lot yeah, of people right. would be grateful to have. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's my collection just, it's, it's pretty fluid at this point. I certainly have like spider is always the brand that I have the most of. I think right now I've got seven looking over there, mm -hmm. maybe eight or nine. If I, I've got multiple cases at this point, I need to centralize my storage system. Um, I, there's always one or two bench maids, a few Protex. I've got the Koenig. Um, there's a few giant mouse knives in my collection. And then there's like some quiet carries. I've got a couple Riet made knives. I've got a CKF. I've got a Ferrum Forge. There's like a several ZTs. Uh, there's a lot of stuff. There's no real like brand loyalty or <laughs> country of origin loyalty or any of that. So you have uh, you you said your favorite is the Koenig Arius. Um, what what about that knife? And then what are the others that? So I'm assuming that this is not going to leave your collection. That's certainly not the plan. Okay. Um, <laughs> so this knife, I, this is actually a Gen Four Koenig Arius. That's beautiful. And it's a plain Jane. This is about as basic as you can possibly get with the knife. You can go way crazier than this one is, but for me and what I look for in a knife, this, like we already talked about with a primary, I have the minimum expectation that if I'm in a pinch and need to use a knife defensively, I, in order for it to go in that spot, I need to be confident in it. Right. Mm -hmm. And this knife ergonomically for me, even being smooth titanium, no texturing, anything like that. It's just a dream in my hands, the way the form factor just fits. I feel really locked in, but comfortable. There's no jimping anywhere that's bothering me. It's just, it feels kind of like it was molded for my hand. And then you've got a really tall hollow grind that mm. gets nice and thin behind the edge. So it's actually a very good slicer. Um, I think it's gorgeous to look at. My favorite way to deploy a knife is to spidey flick it. And this one has the hole for deployment so I can spidey flick it and it does it really well. Or it's got a flipper. It's also very fun. Um, it the tolerances and the way that they dial this action. It's my favorite action of any knife that I've owned or experienced. Just really smooth, very drop shutty, but kind of controlled, not like loose drop shutty. It's like, yeah. you can feel how tight it is. And I like to carry it, like to use it. It's just, it's like the right knife for me. You know? so let me ask you this. How do you reconcile, um, your love of the outdoors, and because this is something that uh, is theoretical to me, but to you, it could be realistic. Your love of the outdoors, hiking, going out, doing outdoorsy stuff, but your favorite knife having bearings. I mean, is there anything there? Would you not bring that out in the wilderness because of those bearings? Or I have and I will again. Um, so it, part of it for me is I've yet to really have a, a bad problem with bearings. Worst case, if I've gotten a knife that's on bearings gummed up, I can still deploy it and it'll lock and it'll still function, right? So like, it might not be pretty if you get a knife on bearings really gummed up internally, but it should still function as a tool, right? It won't be rendered useless. And then on top of that, if I'm outdoors, uh, my day pack has a, a full-time attached, I keep a BGM Pike custom fixed blade oh, yeah, that's that's a nice shoulder knife. carry. So I've got it right up here where even if I'm climbing on a face or something, which I do a little bit of free climbing to like get into places, 
Um, it's in a spot where I can grab it. I can still articulate my legs. Well, that's just like, I've got a fixed blade there. That's comfortable. And usually in my pack, I'll probably have an even larger fixed blade. Sometimes I don't, depending on like, if I know exactly where I'm hiking to, but, mm -hmm. um, a lot of the time, if I don't have my pack, I'll definitely have a belt knife on. So a knife like the Benchmade Luku, it's one of my favorite fixed blades, three V kind of bushcrafter style, just a great robust, tough outdoor fixed blade that I've put enough miles into that I trust it. And so like my folder isn't ever the only knife on me if I'm outdoors. <laughs> so I, I kind of have like the safety net of more robust options if it comes down to it. So, so that question just comes from a nerdy internal, uh, you know, dialogue or monologue, if you will, about like, yeah, but what if sand gets it? Like any of this stuff ever happens to me, which it does. I don't find myself out in the desert worrying about this. Like, yep. why is it a concern? But I was interested. I thought maybe, uh, maybe from your outdoor life, but of course you're out there. You have, you're a knife guy. You have weight you have other options. Yeah. The 80 uh, is on bearings too. And that's hmm. designed to be a, a robust kind of outdoor yeah. knife. If you see the videos that Demco has done of him, like rinsing it out in a river and stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm not worried at all about the internal pivot system. You know, it's a, it's a fantasy worry on my part. Uh, <laughs> sure. You you had the you had the Benchmade Lyoku or however that Luku, is yeah. Lyoku. That was the uh, Knife News uh, Readers Poll Fixed Blade Outdoor Knife of the Year. I just saw that. It was interesting. Yeah. I reviewed that knife a few months ago now, um, probably four or five months ago, and I got it just kind of on a whim because I thought the Puko was really cool, but. Mm -hmm. I already have a tops 10 in Boca Puko. And so I didn't really feel like it made sense to have two Pucos of like pretty much the same size. So when the Luku came out, I was like three V is my favorite outdoor steel. Generally speaking, I like the shape and profile of it. And so I got it right before I went on a camping trip. So it would have been in July. I met a buddy up in the redwoods and, uh, I took it up there with me for a few days and I did all of my fire prep, all of my like camp chores, everything with it. And it was the perfect, like, timing to get that knife and uh it just excelled at everything so then after down here in these canyons i did a bunch of batoning with it and just like kept testing it out and it's been fantastic so i own a decent number of fixed blades and i did not expect to get like a bench made off the shelf fixed blade and have it be one of my favorites but my review was overwhelmingly positive and it's kind of my go-to like belt knife now that's funny because uh, I've I've have spared no time in the past couple of weeks complaining about how people need to expand their vision and you know I I understand this readers poll is you know uh, valuable information because you're getting what readers are think but look at all these other brands why are they going to the benchmark but I I love that you just told me that because I I tend to go off uh some, sometimes I, I I go off the cuff and and I. <laughs> I get incensed by by crazy things, and to me, I was like, I kept seeing Benchmade and Spiderco. It does happen uh, to be that they do make some pretty damn awesome knives, so it's good for me to hear that uh, all of my kvetching was kind of in in vain. Um, yeah. So uh, before we we get to the speed round, which I, I like to ask, I, I like to do a speed round with all r reviewers of knives. But before we get there. Um, I want you to give me a small, short uh, list of your best of 2020 knives, and then what you're looking forward to in 2021, if you if you know much about what's coming out then. Sure. So I did a, a review compiling my, my top 2020 knives and then picking a winner. Um, so the knives that you would have seen in that video would be, this one was kind of more of an honorable mention, but the Spyderco Danger Pickle, because I named it that, which is a lot of fun for me. Um, that's the Birch Tree Blades Flash Batch one. I just, I genuinely love that knife. Yeah. Um, I also included the Ferrum Forge Stinger, which I said is my favorite budget knife of the year. Oh, yeah. This one coming in full retail at 90 bucks, but when you can find them on sale at like 75, just does so many of the things that I love in a knife in general and does them well. Um, what else did I put in there? I had the Quiet Carry Waypoint was in there. I believe that took oh, third place. I adore the this, Waypoint. This knife has really won the hearts of everyone who's touched it. Excellent knife. Um, so yeah, that was in there. The giant mouse ace grand was in there, which is, I actually loaned that out. So I can't hold it up at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the, oh, so the 80, 20 was what I gave second place to 
love that knife. It could have easily taken first place. It was really kind of toss up at that point in the video. Um, but then the winner I picked was the Protec Malibu, which uh -huh. is the only knife on that list that I have two of because I keep loaning the first one out. And uh, it pains me every time I do because I miss it so much. So at California Custom Knife Show, I picked out this all blacked out one, which right now my other one is loaned out. And lucky for me, I don't miss it because I still have I still have one to carry. Okay, so I have a couple of Protex. They're all autos. What is it about the Malibu? Everyone's nuts about that knife too. Tell me about it. I mean, it's beautiful. So a lot of button locks in general tend to be a little bit mushy, especially if they're flippers, right? So when you go to depress the flipper tab, there's like some take up and mush in there, kind of like a squishy trigger, right? But Protec has just really done a fantastic job at figuring out how to set a detent on a button lock. And internally, it's, it's pretty different from any of the other ones out there. So it's just really crisp on deployment and super satisfying bearing, it flies open. And then with it being a button lock, closing the knife is just remarkably drop shutty and pleasant to do as well. So from a fidgeting standpoint, the action is just like so much fun. I like it way better than any of my ProTech autos, which I have a SBR right here. I actually have a, an operator SNG that I need to unbox after we do this tonight because I got delivered today. Um, I love their out the side autos. They're a lot of fun. But on an out-the-side auto, the beauty of an OTF auto is it also is fun to bring in, right? An out-the-side isn't. Like, you have to use your other hand to push it or push it against your leg or, like, do a weird one-handed, like, kind of crimp it. Yeah. It's yeah. not fun. White-knuckle it closed. With yeah. One. So the the Malibu and the Mordax and uh, the, I think it's called the Cambria. I've done a yeah, video on all three Cambria. together. They're all super fun opening and closing. And then on top of that, it's just also a really, really great knife. Like ergos for me are fantastic. It's just the right size for me to be a, like a primary EDC, but it's small enough that if I'm carrying something like the 8020 for fun, I'll throw this in as a secondary because it carries slim. It's lightweight being aluminum. The blade is a phenomenal workhorse Beautiful for blade. cutting. Reverse Tanto is excellent for everything I do with a knife. So just like even if it was a, a chore to open and if it like wasn't fun to play with, it would be a phenomenal cutting tool. And for me, it's like so many of the things that I look for. It's got my favorite clip in the game right now, deep carry all the way to the butt end of the knife, countersunk into the handle with screws that are countersunk into it. It's just like perfection of, of my taste kind of. So that's probably a lot of words for, <laughs> for no, a short no, no, no. looking the for. lack of countersunk screws out there boggles the mind but anyway i mean because that that technology has been around for hundreds of years long time yeah. but but uh uh um uh first of all the blade shape of that to me is total total knockout uh you're mentioning the things that you really uh, i forgot to ask you what is your like golden point for blade size you said if it's going to be in the right front pocket it's got to be for me it's got to be three and a half or more what what is it for you yeah, for me, I would say the smallest that I'll put there would probably be about three and a quarter. That's about yeah. where the Malibu is. Um, but I'm comfortable all the way up to about four. Once you pass four, then a knife has to be pretty magical to be comfortable for me to carry right there. Um, but it, it has happened. I mean, I guess I don't know that I've had anything more than four inches, but I'll get up to that. Four is probably kind of my ceiling for EDC knives. Well, if you plan on going more than four inches uh, in your right front pocket, you're going to have to get with cold steel before the American. Yeah. Um, uh, so 2021, what, what do you know that's coming out? Uh, you, you are one of those mavens out there who, who, who seems to know what's going on. What's out there? Uh, and what are you excited about coming in 2021? Sure. So I would say... Um, I guess I'm less specific about models that are coming out and there's more just kind of like brands I want to watch a little bit more closely. Um, Vero Engineering would be a huge one. I've reviewed his Synapse and his Impulse I had as loaners. And then I'm on the pre-order for his Axon, which should be coming real soon, hopefully. Um, that's the front flipper with a opening slot as well. Looks really cool. It's his first kind of warty design as well. So uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know him. What's his name? Uh, I know Joseph. Vero Engineering, but what's that? Yeah, Joseph Vero. Really uh, nice guy. If you'd like, I'll connect you. I've talked to him on the phone. We we chat every now and then. Um, I actually have one of his pry bars. It's in my fanny pack, so I can't show you. And uh, I, I, I he first came on my radar. Do you remember uh, uh, CM? 
FTW, the the knife maker. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, uh, he had uh, a Vero Engineering uh, micro. Um, oh, what's the what's the really sweet uh, Microtech out the side? Um, Slicey Dicey has a purple one. Um, An LUDT? Yeah, yeah. They made uh, a micro version of the LUDT uh, Vero Engineering. That's how I first heard of them. And it was immaculate and beautiful and small. And, you know, so I that's just that, an that might be a different Vero Engineering. Really? Crazy. So he just, his first knife design came out. I think he delivered it early 2020. Oh. Uh, that was the impulse. And he's so he has a uh, background in engineering and he's worked professionally in a number of interesting spaces. But he just went full time in knife designing and he has all of his production done by Best Tech right now. So he's done, um, he did a run of 100 impulses and then he did, I think, 150 synapses. And then he did a second run of impulses that I think was 200 units. He just did some Synapse XLs and another run of Synapses. He's done the Axon. So he probably, grand total, hasn't even delivered maybe 1,500 knives so okay, far. Okay. So I'm wrong. I'm wrong because I'm thinking of something a little bit a little bit pre this. And now I don't I don't, now I don't remember what I'm – I don't know, remember exactly what it is. I have to dig back in my – When you I, find it, tell me because now I, I'm curious. I will. It was very interesting. Uh, I will. But yeah, so Vero – he just did his drop on his next run of synapses, which is one of the first models he released. Really cool knife. It's a bolster lock, good looking knife. And uh, he that drop sold out in under a minute for 300 knives. And he's been in the game as a knife company for like under a year, which is wow. really, really impressive. Wow. Um, his Facebook group is on fire. There's just people like scouring the earth for anything of his that they can buy pry bars, knives, like a patch people will go nuts for. So, uh, huh. he's a really smart dude who's designing things that are different at this point. Um, and he has even like the, the things on his knives that don't totally click with me when I talk to him about them, he like convinces me because he's thought about it so yeah. much. And he's, he's really analytical and just has a really cool mind on him. He's kind of a genius. So I want to see what next year brings for him. Cause this year was like his breakout year and it's already been wild. Um, also curious to see like companies like Finch knives who kind of okay. started out this year yeah. as well. I've got every one of their current knives I'm getting one of the holidays. Uh, they make really cool knives also manufacturing them with best tech. But um, I like projects like that where it's like newer people. Yeah, I'll always be buying a bunch of spider co's always be getting whatever new bench made actually excites me, although a lot of them don't. Mm -hmm. um, and there's like kind of the standbys, but I like following those those younger guys, OZ uh, machine company, who oh, makes the yeah. Roosevelt, I would do terrible things to, good people <laughs> to get one of those knives. I had a loaner one to review, tried to get one on the drop and I missed it. I couldn't I was like there and ready and it was just too fast. Uh, Dirty so, yeah. deeds done dirt cheap right over here. Yeah. <laughs> just bring the man a knife he'll do what you want there you go open book so uh so vero engineering um thank you for correcting me on that i i i was i, I so now i gotta figure out what i'm talking about but i've watched your i watched your synapse video i think that's the only one yeah those are are beautiful i the okay let's look at that warren cliff to the far right that's the one i've got pre-ordered that's coming soon that is amazing the tanto second from the left that is amazing i mean these are beautiful beautiful yeah. the one on the far left is upcoming that one's not released yet and that'll actually be an integral it's kind of a clip point on it mm -hmm. i think that one's gonna be awesome <laughs> beautiful i like i like uh, i used to have a cutting board like that Lost it in the breakup, but that was years ago. So uh, let's let's do the speed round, shall we? Sure. I'm All a little right. bit scared, but I'm in. Let's do it. Well, uh, I might have to, you know, as we go through, I might I might uh, pause for a moment to tweak it just for you. But I think I think this is pretty pretty solid here. Okay, so uh, we got about 15 questions here, and just answer whatever comes into your mind first. All right. Don't worry about what's right and what's wrong and what you sure. want people to think. Cool. <laughs> Fixed or folder folder flipper or thumb stud flipper front flipper or regular flipper mm -hmm. front flipper washers or bearings bearings tip up or tip down tip up tanto or bowie bowie buoy or bowie 
Bowie. <laughs> David, David Bowie. Yeah. Uh, hollow ground or flat ground? Flat ground. Okay. Uh, um, automatic or Bally song? Oh, automatic. Uh, full size or small? Full size. Gentleman's knife or... I'll, I'll, I'll put it differently. Instead of tactical knife, I'll say self-defense knife because that's what I intended. Gentleman's Ooh. knife or self-defense knife? Like this, like... Oh, hmm, or... Self-defense knife. Okay. <laughs> I could only have one of those two, sure. Gotcha. Uh, ZT or we? Oh, that's a hard one. ZT. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I feel. Okay. So, and, and I'm speaking specifically about locks here. Benchmade or Hogue? Like for the Axis lock? Yeah, like yeah. Who makes that lock better? Yeah. Hogue? <laughs> 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 real steel you'll never work in this business again kid <laughs> uh real steel or steel will steel will okay I, steel not, will or a cold any, steel oh cold steel <laughs> all right milled titanium or spring clip milled titanium no spring clip sorry i was thinking handle for some reason when you said oh. milled titanium and then i was like wait no never mind spring clip for sure yeah I'm with you on that one too. Uh, I, I know the answer to this carbon fiber or micarta. Micarta. Finger choil or no choil. That's so design specific, but finger choil. On, okay. On on your preferred size knife, the large size. Finger choil? Yeah, probably finger choil. Okay. Form or function? Function. Okay. And and lastly, desert island knife. And all I mean by that is not a survival knife, but you get one from here on out and that's it what is it probably the areas i think if i if i had to get rid of everything else mm -hmm. I, I call it my favorite all the time so i think that's the fair thing to say i gotta say i'm very impressed with how quickly you came to that i know you talked before about how it's your favorite knife uh but um you know oftentimes when i think of this when i ask people that my mind goes beyond my collection i'm like oh i think it would have to be you know the giant uh you know machete they all carried in commando that would have to be it you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah i uh it, it, that's one of those questions that people ask me a lot um uh, mm -hmm. a lot of people who've like just found the channel will like send me a dm on instagram not that i mind that i'm not trying to be that guy who's like don't message me i'm too i'm above you or anything like that <laughs> you know what i'm trying to say but I, I get a lot of the same type of question from people who kind of like just start following me and a lot of people are like well what's your favorite knife and it's like it's easier to just have an answer for that right I right could, i could certainly get way out into the weeds and <laughs> allow my mind to go yeah. down those rabbit holes but it's easier to just decisively kona Garius. Yeah. and it's a good answer it's one that i'm not like I'm not going to be mad at myself if that's the only knife ever in my pocket again, either. <laughs> right. So. Right. Right. And no one, uh, not that you care, but no one's going to be like, Oh, well that's, that's kind of an inferior knife for such a, for such a task. I mean, people will think whatever they're going to think. I get a kick out of feedback in general. <laughs> well, Jake, before I wrap, what do you, what do you want to see? Where do you want to see your channel go? You've been, you've been here for less than a year and you're, you're killing it. Uh, where do you want to be in the future? Um, that's a good question. So obviously I just want to kind of continue seeing growth. When I started, I had certain like goals of like by this date, I want to see this number. And I was lucky that I, I think I hit every one of those in my first six months, I was really kind of tracking it. And now I mostly just look at like, I guess the, the type of content that I'm making, I want to make sure that I'm giving the proper time and attention to each knife that I have. And I also don't want to succumb to just reviewing anything because it's new or anything because other people are saying I should review it. I so far have been very pleased with, I've been very selective about what I review. So I get offered like a lot of loaners and there's a lot of new stuff constantly coming out that I'm sure I could get a ton of views on because it just came out today and I'm reviewing it. But I just kind of want to stay true to like my own process and, and picking the gear that I think already that will succeed and that i'm interested in uh, yeah so I, I guess just kind of honoring honoring the path that i'm on and 
not necessarily changing other than like improvements over time. Well, I, I would venture to say that that selectiveness is probably, you know, what, what, uh, what Len, what, why people trust you in the first place, you know what you're talking about. And if you're consistent with what you like and what you don't like, you know, that's, that's where it comes from. That's why people tune into you that and your charming personality and your great videos and your awesome taste in knives. Thank you so much for coming on the knife junkie podcast. I appreciate it, Bob. It's been a blast. It's been a pleasure. And, uh, and you know, Thursday night knives come join us again on that. that that's always a blast. But Absolutely. Thursdays are it's, hit or miss for me but when i'm when i'm available i'll be there absolutely because i enjoy right. it so everybody check out uh check out jake on insta instagram he's bearded underscore gear and bearded gear on youtube for daily amazing knife content not only uh great reviews but also great actual knives that he's reviewing so definitely check him out jake thanks very much take care bro thank you bob the Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Well, there he goes, Jake Wright of Bearded Gear uh, on Instagram, but but for me, mostly YouTube. He's he's one of my uh, YouTube favorites, um, and uh, interesting to hear him talk about his selectivity because, like I said, that's part of the reason uh, why I trust what he says. If you have someone who's who's reviewing stuff, well, I guess I'm talking about myself here. If you talk about, uh, I review stuff across a, a, such a wide uh, expanse. Um, but the, but the point is, Jake actually uses his knives, goes out into the wilderness, and uh, but has also been using them in his EDC life uh, for a long time. And, uh, well, he's just someone I trust, and I, I like I like his reviews, and I like his collection. So, anyway, definitely check out uh, Jake at Bearded Gear, uh, and uh, check him out on Instagram. Uh, that is me. And that is us for the Knife Junkie Podcast. This is episode 174. Let me remind you to check out the Patreon uh, page if you're interested in helping support and bring other great guests to the show. Uh, for Jim, working his magic as usual behind the uh, switcher, I am Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco saying, uh, stay safe out there and never take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast